thank you for joining us. My name is Will Clark, and I'm the International Partnership Manager for the English-speaking markets of T-Bonds. Today, we're going to take a closer look at uh, bond investing in today's low-rate environment. We're going to use the C-Bonds platform to do that. I'm joined by Mark Gross, and he is the Managing Director at Westwood Capital, a New York-based SEC-regulated investment bank, broker, dealer, and asset manager. Mark works principally on the international size of the business, where his focusing is on the cross-border structured private credit transactions for institutional investors, hedge funds, pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, and family offices. Mark has had an extensive career in corporate investment banking, principally in the emerging markets, with senior roles at Standard Chartered Bank, Lehman Brothers, and American Express Bank International. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mark. If Mark, if you would uh, turn on your camera and join us. Great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, you know, I, I think uh, maybe the $64,000 question that uh, kind of sets up this call is why one would invest in bonds in the current environment at all. Um, yields are at or near all-time lows. Governments have implemented massive stimulus programs, frequently successions of programs, as has happened in the United States, uh, to the point where some economists, most notably Larry Summers, a highly respected uh, former Treasury official, Harvard president, um, advisor to Presidents Obama and Clinton, uh, much to the um, disappointment, I guess, of the, uh, of the incoming um, Biden administration has suggested that the program that Biden wants to implement uh, currently uh, would lead to high levels of inflation. In certain markets like Brazil, we're actually already seeing that inflation. And the uh, central bank has indicated that they're looking to raise rates as much as 200 basis points in increments over the next year. Uh, it would also seem that the rollout of COVID vaccines, even though that may take a year, uh, is likely to unleash pent up demand along the way, adding to those inflation concerns. If you were clear-headed enough or crazy enough or risk-embracing enough uh, to invest back in March of last year, uh, well, good for you, first of all, uh, but now might be a good time to think about locking in those gains, not, not piling in now. So frankly, um, why are we here and, and, and why in, invest at this time at all? Um, I guess, you know, a couple of possibilities. Uh, one is that you're an institutional or a day trader uh, looking to move in and out of the market based on small price movements. That's not for the faint of heart and, and not something that, that I do for, for starters. Um, uh, maybe you have a very focused risk allocation where you have a, you, know, you just need to, as the stock market has picked up as it has, um, you, know, you would re, rebalance your portfolio, which would cause you to go into um, to fixed rate assets. Uh, or maybe you're simply looking to just pick up a few basis points you know, over, over a cash yield. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen. Great. So before I get to that, what I say, what I would impart over the next, like, like to impart over the next 25 to 30 minutes is really a framework of how one might approach that analysis and where relative, and I cannot underscore enough that relative is the, really the key word here, uh, opportunities, um, you know, may lie. Uh, but, but to Will's point, uh, first, a, a bit of housekeeping, I am required by, by our um, internal counsel to uh, read this verbatim. So I, I will do that. Uh, this disclaimer, which is basically says that the, uh, the opinions expressed on this call are entirely my own and do not represent those of Westwood Capital LLC. The bonds and other securities that we'll discuss in the course of this call should be viewed as illustrations of how I might approach the analysis of such issues, uh, specifically in the current low interest rate, uh, you know, higher risk environment that, that you know, exists currently. Um, in no case should a discussion of any particular bond or security be interpreted as a recommendation to buy or sell that security, uh, as a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell that security, um, or, or similar bonds or securities. I'd also like to point out that the discussion of the approach that I might take in evaluating these bonds is offered purely for informational and educational and discussion purposes only. Uh, and actually to underscore how C-bonds might be used in such an analysis. Any or all the securities we're gonna discuss here today may be unsuitable for your individual circumstances, for your risk profile, and for your geographic and sector, sector expertise. Again, purely for informational and discussion purposes. Wonderful. So without further ado, I'm gonna log on to uh, C-bonds, and this is the C-bonds homepage. 
And um, Mark, you very kindly uh, sent over a few uh, interesting bonds which we'll discuss today, and I've added them to my watch list already. So I'm just going to open up my watch list, and then we can make a start by taking a look at some of the bonds which we'd like to discuss today. Terrific. So, um, so you just to kind of set set this up, which is that you know there are a couple different ways that one can um, pick up yield, right? One can move further out on the risk spectrum. Uh, one can look at perceived changes in how the bond is perceived, you know, relative to a benchmark like uh, U.S. Treasury, for example. Um, or one can um, uh, look at potential differences in yield, which tend to be fairly small, but differences in yield between two bonds that really more or less have the same risk. And we're going to kind of cover all of those things today. Uh, and I think probably um, what, what I don't want to give you the impression of is that this is about high yield bonds. It's not. Um, we're going to talk about some higher yield bonds, but we're going to move on to some AAA. I'm going to close with uh, a discussion of some, some AAA bonds. But um, you know, with that in mind, um, let's kind of start at the bottom. Uh, one of the hardest hit sectors in the current environment is travel and tourism. And uh, so I think maybe the first one, as I said, again, starting at the bottom, uh, maybe to look at American Airlines. Here we go. And just for everyone out there who's not familiar with the CBONS platform, this is uh, the, the bond page. This is where we'll be able to see, for example, any documents we hold in this bond, credit rating information, and redemption terms, placement terms. And here we have the trading chart. So I think, Mark, we'd like to take a look at the yield for this bond. Which we'll just yeah, and if we can take it out for uh, a year at least, that would be great. Okay. There you go. So nothing unexpected here, right? I mean, what, what actually, the most interesting thing to me is that it didn't immediately plummet uh, in price, that is, um, you know, at the outset of the um, of the pandemic. Uh, it really took a couple months for people to realize that this was not a two week affair. Uh, and, and we see that really, you know, in the early summer, um, U.S. early summer, that is, that's uh, that's when the yields really hit their their top. Uh, and they've since come off, but not nearly to where they were pre pandemic. Uh, and, and and, and which is you know, clear here anyway, but I think an interesting way to think about this is to look at the G spread. And, and, and this is what I mean about just looking at relative risk. And even though the risk of this bond has risen um, and, and fallen back to earth you know, a little bit, um, you know, there's still a significant differential between what its risk perception was pre-pandemic, which was Practically zero relative to the U.S. Treasury, right? I mean, it was a it was a few bips above the uh, above the U.S. Treasury, uh, you know, hundred basis points, hundred fifty basis points. Whereas now, if I recall correctly, it's about a thousand um, over the U.S. Treasury. We go all the way the, uh, to the end there. Well, um, yeah. So we're we're still well, well over a thousand bips over the U.S. Treasury. And one question I might ask myself is, yeah, you know, I think that um, the travel and tour industry, you know, is is correctly um, viewed as having risk, but um, how has that risk profile changed over time? And now as we move toward vaccines and other things, do I think that the thousand basis points or more than that, uh, that I'm above the US Treasury is a reasonable assessment of that risk relative to where we were pre-pandemic and relative to um, you know, uh, what people's individual investors belief is with respect to bouncing back of of um, travel and tourism, business travel, et cetera. Um, so uh, falling back to earth for sure, but still a significant risk pro premium over the US Treasury uh, and, and one that you might want to think about whether or not that's um, a reasonable one. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's move slightly up the scale, but still sticking the same industry uh, and move to Delta. One thing I should have pointed out on the American, if we go up to the top, uh, and then see the top table. So one thing I should have pointed out um, on the uh, American bond is that it is uh, a triple C bond. So not just below investment grade, but significantly below investment grade. Um, American has issues of their own that are individual, you know, unique to it relative to even other airlines. Um, Delta is perceived to be a relatively better risk in the industry, such as it is. Uh, and you see that Delta is, um, depending on whose, whose view you take, either slightly above or slightly into investment grade, slightly below investment grade, or more than slightly below investment grade. But in any case, um, 
you know, in a, in a better position than American. So let's uh, scroll down and kind of do the same thing. Let's look at the yield first uh, over one year. Um, you know, yield there uh, has, um, you know, th there too, um, you know, the, the yield has kind of fallen back to earth. Uh, mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me is you get kind of a similar yield to the American bond mm -hmm. with, if we believe the rating agencies, uh, you know, significantly lower risk, you know, of that, um, you know, of that issue. And if we go to the, once again, to the, um, to the G spread, Okay. We recall that the um, the G spread is smaller, understandably, but we recall that the G spread on the American bond was over a thousand bips, twelve hundred or thirteen hundred. Uh, you know, here uh, we are uh, about three fifty. I guess that would probably be if we go out to the very end there, right? Um, so you know, smaller spread to 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 you know no risk asset, but still a, a sizable pickup uh, on a. Um, you know, on a bond that is perceived to be a significantly higher quality. But let's suppose we like the opportunity of the industry and, and, and kind of have the belief that things are moving toward the better, even if it takes a while. But, you know, the airlines themselves are a little tricky because they're always been highly leveraged. I mean, you know, in the best of circumstances, these guys are highly leveraged and their bonds traded at, you know, significant premiums. Um, so we like the industry and looking for a different way to kind of participate in that. Uh, what we might want to look as at is a um, a company called a, a company like um, the one we're going to look at next, which is uh, Aircorp. Mm -hmm. so, let's take a look. Air, um, Aircap, sorry, Air, Aircap Holdings. Uh, Aircap Holdings does not fly planes; they lease planes. They are, in fact, the world's largest uh, aircraft leasing company. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, their bonds there, uh, you know, we see there that they are solidly, relatively speaking, uh, into investment grade. They're, they're lowest, um, you know, they are just barely by Fitch and Moody's investment grade, uh, a little better on S&P, but, uh, you know, no, um, no differential here on, on whether or not they're investment grade. So, uh, again, we're kind of moving up the risk profile, as you will see, you know, through these bonds. So let's uh, scroll down there, Will, and look the same thing. One year yield for a second. There we go. And uh, same story. Uh, this was kind of wild um, in, uh, in in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, it, it's you know moderated uh, quite a bit. Uh, if we go to the G spread. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the same story. So, which is why, which is kind of what we're trying to underscore here. So, you get the same um, logic behind it as, as you do in other issues in travel and tourism, um, but perhaps with a little less risk. Uh, but again, uh, a, a significant basis point pickup relative to U.S. Treasuries and a significant pickup relative to where they were pre-pandemic as we move out of the pandemic. Uh, just to kind of reinforce that. And, and to show you another capability of C-bonds, let's look at what um, uh, Air, uh, AirCap's uh, share price has done. Okay, good idea. Let's go back into the watch list because I've added that to my watch list as well, and I've put it right here. So opening up a new page here, and here we have the last month's and we'll look at one year as well. The share price. One, one year, yeah, that, that just to kind of get a sense of that. Um, actually, let's go out to three years on this one because I think it's, it's even more dramatic. Oh, well, wow. Yeah. So, so these guys really fell off the cliff um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, bear in mind that all of their leases are collateralized by the planes themselves, that they, they own the planes, right? They can take them back. Um, so, but what we see is a, is a huge fall off early on uh, with, a, with a gradual pickup. N not back to where they were, but, you know, with a gradual pickup. And, and I think the point that I'd like to give you here as a takeaway as we move to the next issue is that I like to look at how the bond is moving in conjunction with a share price. And in fact, um, and maybe this is just where my head's at, 
when everybody's talking about what's going on in the stock market, my first instinct is to look what's going on in the bond market for those issues and kind of see if that's moving in parallel, moving in the opposite direction, presenting an opportunity because the, 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 you know, the, the first phase of the focus is on, on the equity, um, you know, et cetera. And uh, to do that, uh, let's bring up the, uh, the issue du jour, which is uh, GameStop bonds. Yeah. So okay. here too, let's look at the, now, let's talk about GameStop for a second here, right? Which is, <laughs> I mean, uh, the GameStop itself is, is a conversation for another day and, at, uh, and a very controversial one. So I'll try not to get into that controversy here, except to say that, you know, for, for my book, um, you know, there's undervalued and there's undervalued. Um, and I think it's difficult for me to justify the price movements overall in GameStop. Um, but, you know, there may be something going on there and there, and there certainly is an interest in, 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 the, uh, in the equity. Uh, and that may reflect a, um, a longer term viability, you know, for, for, this, for this company. Uh, and, and one that would be reflected in a senior issue to its, uh, you know, to its um, equity, which is its bonds. And I think one interesting thing to, to look at here is, I said we were gonna go from um, non-investment grade to investment grade without stop. That's not exactly true. These guys obviously are, are below investment grade as well. Um, but I think what, what's interesting here is that uh, it is a bond that went out at 10%. You know, The coupon of the bond is 10%. And that's another thing that I always take a look at, which is that you know, in general, unless you're an investor, Investment bankers are, you know, jamokes. Um, you know, typically the the bond coupon is a reflection of what your investment banker thinks your yield is going to be at the time of issue, right? Because presumably we want the bonds to go out at around a hundred. That isn't always the case. Obviously, it's a little above, a little below. But I think if there were a bond issue today and it went out at eighty-five or it went out at one fifteen, um, you know, people would be scratching their heads ab about how it, you know, about the pricing mechanism. So this is a ten percent bond, and you see that it, until recently, was trading at around ten percent. Um, you know, what has occurred uh, is that, um, and. I guess you can be the judge of the degree to which this reflects the fervor around the, um, you know, the equity issue. We see that the bond, you know, has drifted down in, um, you know, in yield. Um, and, you know, what are the implications for that uh, in, in the long term and the short term, I think, are, you know, something, uh, something worth noting. Um, you may not share the view that aid is uh, you might have the view, I guess, probably a better way to put it, that, that eight is the right, uh, you know, the right level, uh, in which case there is a, you know, there's a trade to be made on that. Uh, or you may say that, you know, this interest in, um, you know, in GameStop kind of shows that this company has a longer life than people anticipated and a greater uh, value than people anticipated. And as a consequence, um, you know, the risk associated with this bond is less than the 10%, uh, you know, that was, it was perceived to be at issue. Okay. Um, so, Mark, well, not just, uh, mm -hmm. but moving internationally now uh, is what I would call a slightly fallen angel, which is brass cam. So, do we have it here? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, brass cam, for those of you who uh, are unfamiliar with it, is a Brazilian company, and it is, as the name might imply, uh, a chemical company. Uh, it is one of the largest chemical producers in the world and a massive exporter in that regard. Uh, and as a consequence, they are a significantly U.S. dollar denominated business. So they are um, much less um, sensitive to movements in the real, but more to the point, as the real has weakened, um, you know, a, a has been the case in the past several years, uh, that's actually good for uh, large exporters like Brass Camp. So uh, Brascam, sorry, well, if you can scroll back up uh, for a second. Um, Brascam is just below investment grade, uh, but there's a story to that. So now if we can move down. Uh, and if we can look at the yield for a year, great. So they're just below investment grade <clears throat> only recently. As of July of this past year, um, around July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, something like that, uh, Brascam was downgraded from 
some investment grade, triple B minus, only barely investment grade. But keep in mind that that is in a context of a Brazilian sovereign risk of double B minus, right? So they were sig trading significantly above the sovereign and, and still are, but um, uh, they're still above the sovereign, but they were significantly so, three, three notches uh, up until their downgrade in July. But what's interesting is when you look at July, you, you see that small bump up there, that's around the time um, of the downgrade. So the market did react to it, but not very much, right? And, and then once the market kind of got it, you know, acclimated to that, you see that the yield of brass chem has declined significantly. And I would venture to say that it trades like an issue well above it, it, its current credit rating. Uh, the second uh, point is that um, Brascam is a, uh, it, it was downgraded on uh, it, its commodity uh, exporter. So it was downgraded on the uh, perceived price of its output. Uh, the commodities market is, um, is um, strengthening. Uh, so again, you know, that, that might be an issue that you want to think about in, in the macro context of Brazil, of the commodity market, uh, and of whether or not uh, the the fallen angel status was, was was really justified. Okay, so I'll just uh, do a quick tour of uh, what you can see here in a bond page. You can get the stock exchange OTC quotes and any other details related to this issue. So we haven't gone far down this this, this far down the page yet, but you see the coupon cash flows and, and uh, placement information, identifiers, covenants, and then news related to this issue. So Mark, you mentioned. Uh, about the the change in, in, in the downgrade, this is this is to be found on this section of the the page. So uh, only stocks related to this, but any news would be at the bottom of the page. So for anybody who has not yet used the Zbonds platform, they are uh, advised to, to to check it out like that. Okay, so Mark, we're going to go back into the watch list. Uh, we are going to go on to um, the uh, quasi sovereigns. Okay, yeah. So you prepare this. So as those of you who might have participated in a call we did, I don't know, nine, 10 months ago, um, where I participated, they will um, know that I'm a big fan of quasi-sovereigns. What are quasi-sovereigns? Quasi-sovereigns are companies that are significantly owned and or controlled by the governments uh, you know, where they're domiciled. Uh, they're, they range from 100% owned, um, in, in the case of many of these uh, companies, to uh, only minority owned technically in the case of Petrobras, the Brazilian company, uh, the Brazilian oil company, but, um, but still significantly controlled by the government or government pension funds or quasi government entities. So the, the thinking here is that since they are government backed either explicitly or implicitly, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would be you know, examples of these in the United States that aren't on this list. Um, we have seen in the past that they are implicitly guaranteed by the U.S. government uh, because of the, of the, of the fact of, that they have this explicit or implicit guarantee um, that any yield pickup you get um, relative to the sovereign issue is, is worth analyzing, right? Um, are they exactly the same level even with that guarantee? Well, you know, that, that's up, up to you to decide, but, but you know, that they are government-controlled, government, controlled, government um, you know, uh, guaranteed entities. Um, and they typically fall into two categories, typically. Uh, oil and gas, uh, the state oil company of, of many countries, uh, Pemex, uh, Petrobras, Mexico and Brazil, um, respectively, PDVSA, the Venezuelan um, oil and gas company, Sinopec, Chinese, uh, um, Sinop, also Chinese uh, oil companies uh, are uh, examples of that, uh, or they are state banks or state development banks, uh, import export Bank of Korea, Banco de Brazil, Bank of China, uh, VTB, which is a Russian state owned bank, um, Spur Bank, another Russian state owned bank, um, Ber, VEB, uh, another Russian state owned bank um, are examples of that. Uh, we have uh, also in here the, um, uh, the one that's identified as diversified here is the International Petroleum Investment Corporation, which is really, it's a, it's a um, 
It's a sovereign wealth fund, really, uh, in Abu Dhabi, but it's different from other sovereign wealth funds in that it issues bonds, it sort of leverages its investments and, and, and issues bonds to do so. Uh, but again, it is a sovereign wealth fund implicitly backed by the, uh, by the Emirates. So that's what it's a, um, a quasi sovereign is. Uh, and it's interesting to me to look at, um, you know, how they perform relative to the sovereign itself. And with that, if we can go to one of my favorites, uh, Petrobras. So we're going to go back into the platform and take a look at the bond. Yeah. Uh, we were going to look at the, um, the, the yes, the, the Petrobras versus the Brazilian sovereign. Wonderful. And we have prepared this yeah. using the sequence data. So. Right. So, what we see here is the Brazilian sovereign in uh, the national flag of Brazil green, uh, as well as Petrobras, whose color is also green, but that would be confusing. So I made them blue for today. Um, uh, and, and, and what you see here is, you know, a, um, an illustration of, um, you know, of that point. And, and look, I mean, let's be frank here. We're not talking about a 200 basis point pickup. We're talking about a 5, 10, 15, 20, uh, sometimes 25 point basis pickup. But again, I think the, you know, the evaluation here is that bond relative to its risk and the ability to pick up um, uh, you know, some, um, some ec extra yield beyond the sovereign. In this case, these are Petrobras, to be clear, uh, these are Petrobras US dollar denominated issues against Brazilian sovereign US denominated uh, dollar denominated issues. Okay, uh, the, the last um, illustration, which follows a similar vein, and as I said, um, you know, finishes at the top. Um, there are a number of global development banks in the world, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, the Inter-American Bank, um, uh, and all of these banks, it is important to know, are AAA rated. And they're AAA rated because they're backed not just by the participants uh, of, of the countries that are represented there, but typically uh, through the participation of the US, EU countries, et cetera. So these countries are joint and severally backing these banks. And as a consequence, all of the development banks are AAA rated. Um, and as such, they're an interesting thing to look at relative to um, other AAA rated issues at which they tend to trade a little bit of a premium. Uh, here, I'm actually showing them uh, against the US Treasury, which I guess for the subject of another uh, call is debatable whether it's triple a, a rated or not. As you know, S&P has downgraded the US, in my view, certainly trades like a triple A. Um, so let's call it a triple A for the, for the sake of this argument. Um, maybe it's even a super triple A. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what we see here is the opportunity um, you know, for triple A rated issues relative to the risk of um, you know, triple A rated sovereigns. Now, I, I would probably discount uh, the things we see out at the 16 mark. You know, I've, I've grouped them all together and made them all the same color. Um, you can go in and, and check them out individually on yourself. I, I don't recall what one th those are all the way at the outside. I do recall that the, uh, the African Development Bank tend to be shorter issues, so they uh, represent a disproportionate amount of the ones closer to the, uh, to the zero um, you know, duration. But nonetheless, um, they're all AAA rated. Uh, so I kind of looked at them interchangeably here. I would discount the stuff that's kind of long because I do know that a couple of them are zeros and maybe thinly traded. Uh, so that might account for, you know, I, I don't think that you're going to get 500 basis points or 400 basis points, whatever that is, over the, uh, you know, over the US Treasury yield. But, you know, you see that a lot, of, all of them are above the line by a little bit. Uh, some by 25 to 50 basis points. Uh, so again, I think that that's um, you know, something we're thinking about. And there too, uh, bear in mind that this is against the US Treasury, which we flipped at that last tab, Will. Um, we can actually see that the US Treasury, um, again, we're calling it a AAA for the sake of, let's go, let's go closer to the top, back to the, where the bunch of the AAAs actually reside, right? Um, it, you know, that the US Treasury, which we're calling a, quasi AAA for the sake of this conversation, actually trades much higher than most of the other US uh, uh, AAAs rather. So if we look at the yields of, of Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Denmark, uh, you know, these are uh, Sweden even, these are zero yield or sub-zero yield. So they're significant pickups if, if that's your benchmark. 
If you go a little further down, look at the US, Norway, um, and uh, Australia, the remaining triple A's, Canada, you see that those yields are closer to the US, um, but still uh, the US is uh, the second highest of the, what we're calling the, the AAA group. Uh, so if, if your benchmark is, is you know, something other than the US Treasury, uh, then your pickup is even higher. So I guess you know, that's where I'd like to, to leave you with, is that you know, just with a framework of how you might think about approaching the market in the current environment. And for me, it's sort of you know, all about um, relativity uh, and, and, and relative to what, uh, relative to risk, um, whether that's higher or the same uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and relative to um, abnormalities uh, and, and other arbitrage opportunities that uh, you know, may exist in the market. Wonderful. Um, and I'd like to point out that um, for anybody who would like to get in touch with Mark, um, probably the best way to do that might be over your website, westwoodcapital.com, um, or your email address. I've got it here as well as mgross at westwoodcapital.com. So, um, and from our side, you've all got my email address already. Please do get in touch if you would like to test out the Seabonds platform in a little more detail. Um, my address is w.clark at seabonds.info. So, Mark, thanks again. It was uh, very interesting, uh, and thank you for joining us. And thank you, everyone, who attended for your time today. I hope that it's been um, a useful and productive seminar. Uh, wish you all the best.